Happy Father's Day to you dads out there. It's great to see you all today. And so we're excited to be here in God's house. Thank you for coming to join us at this early hour. Hey, the Bible gives us some insight that we'll kind of work with today a little bit, my message a little later. But in John chapter 10, verse 30, it tells us something really amazing. It says here, Jesus' words in red, I and the Father are one. And so Jesus came to give us a glimpse of who his Father was. And so what a beautiful thing that we have uh, to understand the Father through Jesus and his life. And so I'm really glad that you're here this morning. We want to worship the Lord. And so if you don't mind just standing with us as we pray to begin, God, thank you for giving us this day. Lord, this day, Lord, is made. Lord, this first day of the week that we can begin with worship. Lord, that we can praise your name and lift high your name. And so, God, as we gather together as your people, we do just that. And, Lord, may you be praised today. May your presence be here. And God, may you speak, Lord, something fresh into our lives through one thing or another today, we pray. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.
have some wonderful memories, God, of the Father that you gave us here on earth. And Lord, perhaps for some, those memories are very small or, or few, or maybe not at all. But God, nothing could ever compare to the kind of Father you are. Maybe we had the absolute very best Father that anyone could ever have. And God, you are so much more than even that. And so Lord, today, God, we celebrate the kind of father that you are. Lord, thank you for the earthly father that you gave us. And Lord, for all that they were and for all that they weren't, God, we're grateful. Lord, help us never lose sight, Jesus, that you are a father. Lord, that you are a father to each of your children, Lord. Lord, there are daughters here this morning. There are sons here this morning that you look down and say, thank you. Thank you for recognizing me as your heavenly so, God, we do that today, Lord. We recognize you. We recognize you. We thank you. We, we, we sing our praises to you. Thank you, Lord. We acknowledge you in our lives, Lord. And so, Jesus, on this day, Lord, we're saying, God, thank you for being a wonderful father. Happy Father's Day to our heavenly Father. Lord, thank you, Jesus. God, thank you that the Bible tells us that we can cast our cares upon you. So, Lord, with our needs that we may have, Lord, maybe that maybe our hearts are heavy with the need for someone that we know, Lord, and it's maybe not our own. So, God, we just bring those needs before you, thanking you, God, for, for caring about that. And, and Lord, we, we just think of others, Lord, too, that are walking through grief, Lord. We're lifting up the Crawford family, Lord, that, that laid to rest, Lord, they're Father, husband, Lord, brother, God, thank you, Lord, for caring for us in times of grief. And so, Jesus, thank you for, for helping us, Lord. And so, God, we think of families, Lord, the Heiser family, Lord, and other families in our church, that uh, the Galloway family, that have lost loved ones in the past weeks and months. And so, God, we just ask for your help, Lord. We just know, God, that you care for us in times Lord, when we're feeling low, when we're feeling discouraged, Lord, when our hearts are heavy. And so thank you, God. Thank you, God, that you're meeting needs here today, needs of healing, Lord, needs of your provision. God, needs of discouragement, Lord, maybe even depression. And Lord, maybe even needs of addiction. God, we just ask that you be our deliverer today. God, that you would be our strength, Lord, that you would make a way, Lord, dry places in our lives, Lord, that we just feel, Lord, a distance. And so, God, we just ask you to refresh us today. May we experience you as our heavenly Father in a whole brand new way. Thank you for
for being a good, good father. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Amen. Well, let's thank the Lord and give him a hand today. Thank you, God. Amen. Now do me a huge favor and notice someone and give them a wave, a, a high five in the air without touching their hand. And so say good morning to someone as you're seated. Welcome back, Evangel Church. Hey, got Abigail here with me, What's by up, the way. Guys? Abigail's my wife. And uh, we are just so excited to be back here with service with you guys at the church. And for those joining us online, hey, thanks for hanging out with us still. Hey, we just really want to quickly first say, Happy Father's Day. We are so glad that you fathers are out here celebrating Father's Day here with us here at Evangel. We're excited to celebrate with you. Speaking of which, I dressed up. Can you see? I got my tie on today. Uh, just kidding. This is what you can get today. This stylish tie that happens to be a cookie. Delicious and stylish. Hmm. Now, don't mind me talking with my mouth full, but maybe you're feeling nice the t-shirt. Right Number one dad. Hey, good news about this, one size fits all. So, on your way out this morning, fathers, make sure you pick up a cookie. There's also a gift card attached to our local friendly, the Park Place Cafe. We're pumped about that. that is it's awesome. a good place, right? Yes. Also, want to let you guys know that some of you, before all this happened, had signed up for a new members class. And we're glad to let you know that we have that coming up soon. And so for those that signed up, you'll get a reminder that you signed up to be a part of that. And maybe you're like, well, I want to be a part of that class too. That's awesome. That is going to be July 19th, okay, at 530 that's a Sunday night. We're going to come together. We'll, we'll, we'll make sure everything uh, safe, social distancing, and all the safe practices are in place still. We're going to come together and uh, do that class that we've been waiting months to do now at this yeah. point. And I know Pastor's excited about that one. Another thing we haven't done in a very long time, Abigail. Do you know what we haven't done in a long time? I do, and I'm so excited that we are finally back so we can do this. And yeah. I believe yeah. that it is. BGMC Sunday. BGMC Sunday is coming up, and that's just next Sunday. Yes. Now things got to look a little different again to make sure that we're uh, safe practices are in place. Mm -hmm. And so, sadly, that does not mean that we can't have the kids running around and just collecting change. It's just not the safest practice. But what we will do is have the two buckets out, so when you come in, you're able to uh, kids dump your change. Uh, into the buckets and parents and adults uh, bring your loose change and your green dollar bills because those are great too and you're able to drop those in and then we'll take a time during the service to weigh those and see exactly uh, how much uh, or not how much but who has more weight in theirs and then we'll find out about the how much later on yeah. but it's gonna be awesome so make sure you're bringing your buddy barrels your pickle jars whatever you've been putting money in and piggy also banks. those green, yeah, you piggy banks, mm -hmm. and those green envelopes that were on the wall, some of you took those, and now is your chance to start bringing those back. And if you didn't get one, feel free to ask one of our leaders to get one down for you that you could take back and bring back with that amount because we still have a goal set for the end of the year, and, uh, well, we're a little bit behind now with everything that happened. And so if we can get all those envelopes off the wall, we'll surpass our goal still. Amazing. So it's going to be awesome. So don't forget BGMC Sunday next Sunday. Hey, guys, so not only does, is BGMC Sunday next week, not only is today Father's Day, um, but next Saturday uh, is Otis Heiser's. Now, I apologize if I'm butchering that last name. His funeral will be held here at the church. At the, the visitation hour starts at 11, and the service will be at 12. And uh, Otis was a longtime member at Evangel, had been here for, for many, many years, uh, very faithful to the church. And so if you remember him um, or would like to come out, that's that's uh, next Saturday, so or this upcoming Saturday, I should say. Yeah, and as we know, friends and family, um, we lost a dear friend and brother in Christ, Perry Crawford, last weekend. 
and we just want to thank everyone who came out on this past Friday to support the Crawford family um, and just was there for them and supporting them um, and for all your prayers um, but we want to make sure that we're continuing to pray for them because as we know this is a very hard time for the family um, and if you happen to not be able to come this past Friday to um, show your love and support there is a website that you can visit um, it's called rememberingperry.com where you can um, write on there a fun memory or a wonderful memory that you have of Perry to share with the family so that they just continue to feel that love and support. Um, and also there are some other updates on there. Um, but again, we just want to keep them in prayer um, because we know that it is hard and um, we just want to show as much love as we can to this family. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, as we transition into offering, we just want to remind you guys of well, we were saying four ways to give, but it's technically five ways now. Um, that's through our website, myevangel.com. You can check out that website. Um, you can go on to there, and you'll see all these ways on there. But you can go on the website and give. You can download an app called Simple Give and find the church on there and give your amount that way. They also have a number that you can, uh, I believe, text in your amount, uh, as well as mailing. For those that want you can mail it in and now for those that are meeting here and coming back to church you can just drop it off on your way out of service there will be a collection box i believe there for you to drop it in so as the announcements have been going you can be getting that ready and, and hopefully you'll have yourself a reminder to drop that off into that uh collection basket at the end yeah. so yeah, and you know, I actually was thinking, it kind of goes along with BGMC Sunday okay. and offering. Okay. Um, but I was talking to my mom the other day, and she mm -hmm. told this really cool story. So missionaries do have to raise support to be on the field. Um, and she was fervently praying, like, Lord, make, you know, help me to not make a mistake. Help me to know I'm doing your will. So when she first got on the field, um, her first term, her very first year, her support just bought. And she said she never actually hit zero, but she was really worried. And she said, Lord, I asked you not to help, not to have me make a mistake. And um, what's crazy is that she said that the Lord showed up in a miraculous way. Yeah. And for the full four years that she was there for her first term, never once did it hit zero. There might've been some days where she was like kind of close, yeah. but she made it through the full four, four terms. <laughs> And so that just goes to say, one, how important it is to give to missions for BGMC. But also when we tithe, sometimes we look at our bank account and we're like, I don't know if I can give. I don't have enough money to give. Sure. But we have to remember we serve a faithful God mm -hmm. and a God who provides and a God who does miracles. So even though your bank account might not be where you want it to be, continue to be faithful in giving and God will continue to um, provide for you and show up in ways that you probably could have never imagined. So yeah. just to encourage you, family, um, continue to give and to tithe and um, trust the Lord with that 10% of your money. Yeah, absolutely. And for those who may not know, Abigail's mom is a missionary. So when we talk about being on the field and wondering if you know she's going to be able to stay out there and in the right, uh, talking about her mom being on the field, on the missions field to Belize. And you know, they have to raise the funds. Missionaries have to raise the funds. So when we collect our tithes and offering, you know, and you're, you're giving towards mission, BGM gives towards missions, uh, we're helping uh, fill their their account in a sense, and not even account, but just the funds they will need to be able to spread the gospel. When we say your giving is helping spread the gospel, it might be to be able to pay for rent wherever they're staying, or it may be to get Bibles in that language. of. So it, oh, it, it varies, but nonetheless, that's why it's important. That's why we believe mm -hmm. in giving to missions and, and, and we take that up. So, yeah, that's awesome. Well, hey, let's uh, bow our heads and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for today, Lord. Lord, thank you for uh, being our provider, being faithful, Lord. Lord, help us to be faithful, Lord. It, it says that when we're faithful with little, you can, you know, um, you're able to provide us with much. You know, Lord, and so we just pray that we're faithful in the things that you already have given us, Lord, and we're faithful to you, Lord, uh, as you've been faithful to us. Mm -hmm. And God, so we just pray for this Sunday, Lord. We pray for the this, this service as it goes on. Lord, we pray for Pastor as he gets up to give this word that you would just speak through him, Lord, and this time. In your name, amen. 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 Let's hear another amazing word from our lead pastor, Pastor Jay. 
Hey, those are good. I actually have a few funny ones myself. <laughs> I know. I think I like mine better. And so, but in the meantime, before I start telling my jokes, we're looking for a couple of guys that would like to do a little putting contest with us. So, if you are a golfer, or maybe you're not a golfer, but you want to come on up and try to win some free golf balls. We're giving away some golf balls this morning. So I'm looking for a couple of guys, so come on up here if that's you, all right? But what did the daddy corn say to the mama corn? Where's popcorn? Hey, isn't that a fun one? And so why did the baby strawberry cry? Because his dad was in a Jam, right, exactly. What did the daddy tomato say to the baby tomato? Catch up. <sighs> um, let's see. Why did the cookie cry? This one was kind of fun. Because his father was a wafer so long. <laughs> and what did the daddy spider say to the baby spider? You spend too much time on the web. Very good, very good. Hey, well, I like this uh, one story, but we'll save this. So no takers on putting? Nobody wants to try to win? You, you can compete against me. Oh, Fred, come on up. Come on up, Fred. We have to do this. We're going to do this. So, Fred, we're going to see. Um, so here we go. So, let's, I'll go first, Fred could go second. So, the girls are gonna wipe these, uh, these off here. So, let's, uh, so pull, pull that one cord, not that one, that one's the obstacle, that other one. Just scoot that out of the way. So, the goal will be, Fred, okay, I'm gonna take, Morgan, you bring us, no, 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 we'll, we're, we're gonna aim for the circle right here. So, Fred, this right here, this is the green, okay? We're making this up as we go. So, so you have to get it inside of the circle. That is the green. Okay. So, Fred, here, Morgan, one more ball. Good. So, Fred, I'm going to take one shot. I did not practice this before. Okay. So, I'll let you, you want to go first or you want to go second? <laughs> here, Fred's going to go first. So, just let her wipe that off in case there's any coronavirus on there. I don't know if there is or not, so. but we're going to be safe. So, Fred, you got two shots to get it in the circle. There we go. You got the obstacle. This is fun. Now, this is fun. Over the obstacle. Hey, it stayed up. That's not bad. Yep. Now, you can move that ball if you want, if you want to move that ball a little bit. Here, wait, 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 wait. This. That's really good. Okay, so we'll leave that one there. We'll leave those there. Thank you, sir. Great job. Okay. Give, give, we, we've got to give Fred his prizes. So, okay. Sure. There you go, Fred. You're our only contestant, so you get all four. So, now I am going to try to beat that with just one. <laughs> Not to say I ever practice putting. I haven't golfed yet this year, but when I talk to people on the phone, though, I usually wear my headset and I putt around my office while I talk to you. <laughs> so if you're talking to me and you hear this little tick sound, that usually means that I'm golfing. Isn't that kind of crazy? All right, here we go, here we go. Fred beat me. <laughs> Fred, you beat me with both. Oh, that's horrible. Okay, very good. Well, that's fun. Hey, well. We're talking about uh, Father's Day today, and uh, um, we if you grab your Bible, open it to Mark chapter 1, Mark chapter 1, Dad, are bugs good to eat, uh, asked the boy. Let's not talk about such things at the dinner table, son, his father replied. After dinner, the father inquired, now son. What did you want to ask me? Oh, nothing, said the boy. There was a bug in your soup, but now it's gone. <laughs> How about that, eh? 
And so a few weeks ago, I requested of Zoe, Zoe, Father's Day is coming. I want you to lead the song, Good, Good Father. I, you know, God just put that song in my heart for this Sunday. Um, of course, Father's Day and so forth, and I, I didn't all know what that was about. And so I took the time to uh, look up what that song was all about. I knew Chris Tomlin sang it. I assume his name's always written by it when you see uh, that song. So I thought he wrote it. He actually didn't write it. And so Anthony Brown, uh, and uh, known as Tony Brown, and Pat Barrett, um, they were the co-writers of the song Good, Good Father. Chris Tomlin just kind of made it famous. And they tell the story of how... Uh, the, the chorus came about, and so people were actually singing the chorus. And Tony explains that he wrote the song because he didn't have a dad in his life, okay? And uh, the only one uh, I've ever called father is God. He said that the chorus arose during spontaneous worship, that they used the chorus in worship for about four years before they sat down with Pat to compose the entire song. Just saying good once was not enough. So they added a second good to it. Good, good father helps us. Here's what they say. Good, good father helps us unlearn damaging things that you heard about God. Okay? You are perfect in all of your ways is the bridge to us. God's goodness, it personalizes it to us. The result is a powerful song that many people relate to on a deep level. How many people had heard that song before we, uh, before we sung it today? Okay, so for some of you, it might have been your first time. So both Tony and, uh, and Pat understand that their song carries a priceless message uh, from God as he is worshiped through it all. All of us relate to this message of the Father's love, some as sons and daughters and some as fathers. And so that song really kind of served as some inspiration for me, um, and I began digging into that. And so we're there in, in Mark chapter 1. Now, we're not passing out uh, note sheets, but if you want one, we do have them. You just have to grab it on your way in the sanctuary. They're on the table out there. So if you uh, went out there to grab one right now, you would not offend me. That would be perfectly fine. And so, but uh, um, on there, Roman numeral number one, the process. So there was a, a process in the life of Jesus that was taking place. And so there were some moments of change that happened in Jesus' life. So the Gospels, of course, is the story of Jesus. It, it tells us about um, what God was accomplishing through him and what took place and, and the moments. And so letter A right there, the beginning. And so there were some key moments of change in Jesus' life. And so that first key moment was the birth of Jesus. It was fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. And so Jesus was born and fulfilling prophecy. And so then there came this key moment, uh, number two right there, the visit to the temple at age 12. That was a pivotal moment in Jesus' life. And so I don't know you and I, we have moments in our lives. We have moments in our lives where God did something really powerful in our life, where we think back, and, and that kind of was a, a pivotal moment. That My life kind of hinged right there. Okay, I don't know about you, but I have some of those moments. Maybe you can recollect some of those moments. And so that second one, the visit to the temple for Jesus at age 12, it brought an awareness of who he was, but who his father was. Where have you been, Jesus? His mom and dad said to him, where have you been? Well, I've been at my father's house. And I thought you would have known that. And so Jesus had an awareness, and what a great thing. Now, here is something really fascinating to me. This, to me, is really amazing, is that the next pivotal moment in Jesus' life, it really didn't happen for another 18 years. It was another 18 years, and that was his ministry. And so an understanding of why he came, and he began doing it. 
Now, in our culture, we would have wanted to see Jesus. Maybe you, as, as, uh, if this was your son, you would have probably been like saying, hey there, young fella, it's time to get going. What age would you have been kind of being like, let's get rolling here? Probably at age 18, right? Isn't that more of our culture? And so Jesus stayed back there in Nazareth doing the family trade. What was the family trade? Anybody remember? Yes, he's building chairs. He's building tables. He's a carpenter. He's working with wood. And so someone called me just this weekend. Pastor, we have any carpenters in our church? We've got some work that we need to get done on our house. And so I referred uh, them to uh, someone that we've used just recently. And, and matter of fact, both here at our church and at our house. And so a carpenter. Now that sounds like an old-fashioned term, right? And so you don't hear too many people uh, growing up, I'm, I, I want to be a carpenter, right? But back in the day, that's what Jesus was. And so there were those moments. And so it, it was, number two, God's appointed time for Jesus to begin his ministry. And so his ministry, that number three right there, God's appointed time came about. And that's where we pick up our, 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 our verses here. Mark chapter 1, right there at verse time. Verse 9, at that time, at that time, I love that phrase right there, at that time, it was God's appointed time for Jesus to begin. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth into Galilee. Nazareth represented his hometown. Jesus of, we know him as Jesus of what? Jesus of Nazareth, okay? And the Bible says something right here. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth. God is accomplishing a timing in your life. He has a timing for the things. There are things that hinge upon God's timing. You know that? That's a beautiful thing. And there was a hinge that swung open. I, I like that. I don't know if you've ever uh, used a hinge before or looked at a hinge or had to put a door on or take a door off or, or maybe you're trying to move your refrigerator in or out of the house and, and the door frame wasn't big enough and you had to take that off. There, there, there's a, a hinge that swings that door. And I believe that there are doors in our lives that open and close by God's doing. And so at that time, the Bible says, Jesus uh, came from Nazareth to Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. And so what we see here is this verse transitions the focus at that time, uh, the focus of the narrative from John the Baptist to Jesus, okay? Um, uh, it was more informational about what was happening, and then Mark, in typical fashion, he, he does this with no fanfare or very little background. There is no mention of Jesus' birth in Mark's gospel. Uh, the Old Testament prophecies, which... Uh, uh, of his birth were fulfilled. And even the time frame along uh, happened there, in, uh, uh, puts it in the late 20s or, or 30 AD. Uh, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, but was primarily raised in Nazareth. And so let her be right there. God has an appointed, has appointed times for my life. God has appointed times for your life. And so in those times, that he causes things to happen, that he brings you from one place to another. He brings you from your Nazareth to your Galilee. He brings you from, from maybe the trade of carpentry to the trade of teaching. Maybe, maybe like Jesus' life, maybe your life takes a turn that you never saw coming. Maybe you just always assume that you'd do what your parents did. And all of a sudden, now God's saying, I have something new for you. You know, you can trust him in that. You can, 
You can walk by faith in that. I remember, for me, I just had an assumption that I was always going to be a farmer. When I was a kid playing with tractors, okay, my toys when I was a kid were tractors. I don't know what your toys were, but it was little tractors. I had a plow and a disc, and, and uh, I, I played farming. And I just imagine how many cows we had on, on, my, on my farm and my cousin, he and I, we ran the farm together, my cousin Dean, and, and that, that's what I, I, I love playing toys. I love playing tractors. I love playing farm. I just always assumed that. And when it came to be that time, God moved me uh, from the farm to ministry. And it was his plan. God had some appointed times for my life, just like he has for each of you. And so uh, let her see right there, uh, my three hinges. And so there are some hinges. Uh, and so here's what I think is really special. Jesus came, and the Bible says, as we open today with, is I and the Father are one. And so Jesus came to give us a glimpse of who the Father was. So we see God the Father through Jesus, okay, we get a glimpse of how God sees us through Jesus as well. And so we as a son uh, of God, we as daughters of God, we get a glimpse of God's heart towards us as his children. And so we have some hinges, some pivotal times in our lives. And so let her see right there, number one, born to your parents. And so when you're born to your parents, you know, that's a, a fulfillment to what God told Adam and Eve to go and have children, to go and populate this world. And so, in a sense, when you're born, that's a prophetic fulfillment of something that God ordained. How exciting is that? So you might not have thought about that, but, but your being born on this earth was part of a fulfillment that God directed. And so you are here today, each and every one of you, as a fulfillment of prophecy. God spoke that. And so you may have always thought that your life was just kind of ho-hum. Your life is a, a fulfillment of prophetic prophecy that God told Adam and Eve. That's a really exciting thing. And so the second hinge that's pivotal and powerful in your life is an awareness of God and his desire to be in relationship with him. And so there's an awareness. I just believe that every single person at one point or another, you experience this God encounter and you have this awareness of that God's alive, that he's real and that he wants me to be in fellowship with him. I really think that that's one of the first things that we encounter. Um, not just a belief in God, but that God wants to have fellowship with me. I think that's one of the second hinges in our life. And the third one um, is a pivot from a me-centered life to a God-centered life, okay? Uh, the, the third hinge, and this is the one I, I feel like when that things can really get exciting for your life, is when your life goes from being about you to being about God. When you step out of the center and allow God in that place. So... That to me, and so you're, you're, you are living in an appointed time. And so I really love um, that thing. Maybe you've heard that Abbott and Costello back in the day. They did that routine called Who's On First, okay? Remember that? The incredible sense of timing between these two actors and the material that this was known as one of the greatest comedic routines in, in like history, Abbott and Costello, um, in American entertainment. It's a brilliant written piece. If you've never heard this before, you've got to go on YouTube and, and listen to it. But the comedy and the timing, it's really what makes it funny. And so timing in sports is really everything. It, it's uh, it, it, it's it what causes competitors to either win or lose in order to be successful in humor, sports, relationships, and yes, even faith. One must be attentive to timing, that there's a timing that's happening in our lives. There are two essential elements to timing, listening and responding. 
And in Mark, Jesus is, begins his ministry just as, that, uh, as the Bible says right there in Mark chapter 1, verse 9. At the right time. At the right time. And so Jesus begins by listening to God. And at that time, Jesus came from Nazareth. Okay, he didn't arbitrarily arrive at the Jordan River. He arrived at God's perfect time. And it required listening to God and following his leading. And so I just want to encourage you in your life. I just really believe that God is speaking into our lives on an everyday basis. The question winds up being is, how well are we listening? How well are we listening? Are we following the prompts that God wants to give us? And there are times in our lives where those prompts will lead you to a significant change. And wow, you know, I really thank God wants me to do this. And so I love that. And so number two right there is preparation. So point number one, uh, if you're noting that, is process. Okay. Point number two there, Roman numeral two, is preparation and equipping. And so God was accomplishing that in his son. And so letter A, baptism. And so we see that he came uh, from Nazareth to Galilee and was baptized by John. And so we see there in the text that number one is there was a reluctance. There was a reluctance by John. Baptism, even in John's era, was a sign uh, that you believed and followed the words of the baptizer. And so this wasn't like this foreign thing. What are you doing dunking people in the water? No, this was kind of uh, something that people understood, okay, and that the message of that baptizer was a message you were going to follow. And so part of the reason why we're baptized in, in water is that we're making a conscious decision to follow that message. John um, is very reluctant to baptize Jesus. John wishes uh, to publicly follow Jesus and doesn't understand how he could baptize someone whose sandals he wasn't even worthy to untie. This was a difficult thing. And, and and so, and just like us, sometimes there's this reluctance. There's this reluctance to do what God is prompting us to do. There's a reluctance in that we don't see ourselves as worthy, or we don't see that path as being significant. Or we, we may have a lot of reasons why we don't do what God's putting on our heart to do. Or maybe a little bit like what Pastor Luke and Abigail were talking about, is, is maybe there's a little bit of a faith issue of, wow, well, what happens if I did that, then how will everything else work out? And so sometimes it's a point of trusting God that stepping out of the center of having it about me and ha letting God into that place. And so many believers, they've got that reluctance. And so um, I, I, I came back to uh, a gentleman in our church. Some of you may remember John Smith, longtime uh, person in our church, a deacon, uh, Marcia's husband. He passed a couple of years ago, but I remember one day going up to him and saying, John, I really feel that God wants us to have a class happening in our church called Financial Peace University. John and Marcia, we're doing just a fabulous job leading our marriage ministry here at the church. And a matter of fact, our marriage class is, is happening today. As a result, it's not happening today. <laughs> okay. But we have a marriage ministry at our church because of the things that John and Marcia Smith did and how God used them. And so I'm going up to John, and I'm like, John, I, I want to ask you to, to pray about something. I, I want to ask you to pray about leading our financial peace class. And he, at first, expressed a reluctance. He expressed a reluctance. He's like, Pastor, I, I don't know if I am the right person for that. I am not a good example when it comes to finances. He's like, Pastor, I have probably have, um, am the worst example. I have made all of the mistakes. I said, John, I think that really makes you a great example of, to teach this class. And so he prayed about it, and he said, you know what? We're going to do it. We're going to do it. He was reluctant. He was reluctant. But God used them to help many, many people over the years with their
finances. And so what a beautiful thing. And so I think of him. And John the Baptist had this reluctance, but he concluded that it was a moment of faith that God had prepared him for. And so sometimes there's a reluctance, but in that reluctance comes, number two, a validation. And so it, it was being baptized by John that Jesus validates John's message of repentance and forgiveness. And so in Mark chapter 1, people from all over the region confess and repent. And here Jesus affirms their actions, that what they were doing was exactly right. And eventually he'll go even further by taking their sins at the cross so that they can be forgiven and their relationship with God restored. And so their God's affirmation is far different than the affirmation that we get from the world. And so there is a reluctance, a validation that takes place. And then number three, a precedence and importance of baptism comes. And, and that's our example and why we encourage you to be baptized. Why? It's an important thing for you to do. It's a, it's, it's a precedent that Jesus set for us. Um, and it's an importance because you're saying that that message is a message that I'm going to follow after, that my life is going to live for. And so in our um, uh, preparation for service, God has a vantage point that we don't always see. God can see things for our life that, that we miss sometimes. I love what Oswald Chambers says. He says, patience is more than endurance. A saint's life is in the hands of God like a bow and arrow in the hands of an archer. God is aiming at something the saint cannot see and stretches and strains and every now and again the saint says I can't stand it anymore this isn't going well for me God does not heed he goes on stretching till his purpose is in sight and then he lets it fly he lets it fly trust yourself in God's hands Maintain your relationship to Jesus Christ by the patience of faith. The Bible says, and Oswald Chambers closes with this, he says, though he slay me, yet I will trust him. Okay? What a great, great uh, quote there from Oswald Chambers. And so um, uh, I, I just want to go on to, and I'm, and I'm looking at this last passage. The voice came from heaven. You are my son in whom I love, with you I am well pleased. I'm thinking, okay, I use process, I use preparation. I'm like, I need a P word. What's a good P word? I need a P word. And I'm like, what is this saying? And I'm like, wait a minute, pronouncement, pronouncement. I'm thinking that Jesus is speaking a pronouncement, a pronouncement. And so I looked up that word, um, and defined it, it says a formal or authoritative announcement or declaration. I'm like, that's exactly what Jesus is saying, what God is saying over Jesus right now in this moment, okay? Now, I don't know about you, but when I am at a wedding, uh, there in every marriage is a pronouncement. I have that word written in my notes every single wedding that I've ever done. Now, I don't always say the word pronouncement, but it's speaking that. It's, it's that time where they go from being individuals to being a married couple. It's that time when they go from being a woman and a man to being a husband and a wife. It's a pronouncement. It's your now Mr. and Mrs., okay? You're now Mr. and Mrs. Kurt Kukta. You're now uh, Mr. And, 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 and Mrs. And, and it's that fill in that blank for your life. It's a pronouncement. You're no longer who you were, but now you're someone new. And so God is speaking that over Jesus. And God's speaking that over our lives. 
in this moment, in this pivotal place, in this hinge place. And so I think of that, and, and uh, I think of marriage. And um, number two, it's a powerful and poignant moment for me. I always ask each couple, I'm like, okay, I'm going to introduce you at this point, okay? And, uh, and I call it a privilege, you know, to introduce for the very first time. And so I let them say, do you, do you want me to say it this way? Do you want me to say, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Kurt and Lauren Kukta? Do you want me just to say Mr. and Mrs. Kukta? Or do you want me to say Mr. I, I'm a pretty flexible fella, okay? I'm just here to tell you. I, I'll, I'm, I'm happy to tailor make that. Um, however that they want, it, they want that to be. But to me, that pronouncement is huge. That is the point in which I am declaring them as God's representative in, in, in this ceremony. I am declaring them husband and wife. And in this ceremony that's happening here at the Jordan River, God the Father is speaking a poignant and powerful pronouncement. And number three, I love this. It's the only occasion when one plus one equals one, okay? Now, I know in math that that's not true. But at a wedding, one plus one actually equals one. A man and a woman equals a husband and wife. They become one. They become one flesh. The Bible tells us actually all the way back in the book of Genesis. Therefore, you'll leave your father and mother, and you'll cleave to your husband, and you'll become one. And so the father's pronouncement over your life, let her be right there. I love this. The Amplified says, verse 11, this way, and a voice came out of heaven saying, you are my beloved son, and you I am well pleased and delighted. Beloved son or daughter, that, that, that Greek word right there is apopetos, and uh, Agapetos. And so it's defined as esteemed, dear, favorite, worthy of love. Esteemed, dear, favorite. You are my beloved. God's saying to Jesus, God's saying to you today that you are his beloved. That's what God says over you. That's the pronouncement that God makes over your life. That you are his esteemed. That you're his dear. You're his favorite. You're God's favorite. That's a pretty cool thing to say. Yes. Now, when I say that to my kids, I always have to be careful. I have to put a qualifying statement. You're my favorite youngest daughter. You're my favorite. Uh, and so I have to make sure I'm putting a little extra detail there. But you're God's favorite. Isn't that a pretty, tell your neighbor, I'm God's favorite. Tell your neighbor that. What a great thing to discover. You're God's favorite. And then the father goes on to say, in whom I am well pleased, number two right there, and delighted, okay? Uh, idu, idu, okay. And that means is one's good pleasure, okay? To prefer, uh, to be favorably inclined towards one. That, that's what that Greek word is saying there. We're God's favorite. Our picture is on God's refrigerator, if he had one, okay? Not sure what he'd put inside of there. Um, maybe communion uh, juice. I don't know. I'm just kidding. Um, but if he had one, your picture would be on there. And so I, I just think it's so important for you on this Father's Day to understand what the Father thinks about you. And we understand that by seeing what the Father thought about his son Jesus. And so we can have a point of reference of our good, good father. Harry Emerson Fostick uh, was one of the greatest American preachers of his century back um, in the 1800s. He described his preaching as counseling on a large scale. Few people knew that as a young seminary student, he reached the breaking point after working one summer in the New York Bowery Mission. The Bowery Mission had served the homeless and the hungry uh, New Yorkers in the 1870s. And it, when it's uh, in its neighborhood, it came to be defined as, as Skid Row, uh, children's programs uh, called Mount 
Mont Lawn City Camp and Mont Lawn Summer Camp, served at-risk kids in 1894 by giving the children of recent immigrants a chance to escape the, uh, the, the, the tenements uh, in the summer. Today, the Bowery Mission is a result-oriented organization that is recognized in New York as one of the most effective missions. So, but for, for Henry Emerson Fostick, after ministry at the mission, he came home and he was overcome by deep depression. One day he stood in his bathroom with a straight razor, okay, uh, and he, he put it to his throat. He was very discouraged and depressed. And he thought about taking his own life in that moment. And then, and, and then he heard his father in the other room calling his name, Harry! Harry! It called him back. He never forgot it. It was like the voice of God calling him. So I want to remind you today that in those times when you're in the wilderness, trying to find your way through, when temptation comes and offers you the wrong answer, the wrong choice, the wrong use of power, the way to popularity, the wrong kind of partnership, then you remember God has called your name. He's called your name. This is my beloved son. This is my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased. God's saying that I'm his favorite. I'm his favorite. I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm God's favorite. But you need to say it the same way. I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm God's favorite today. I am God's favorite, and he is well pleased with me. He is well pleased. You may have gone through your whole life thinking that you've never matched up, thinking that you've never done well enough, thinking that you've blown it on so many counts and places. But God doesn't see it that way. Your heavenly father doesn't see it that way. You're his favorite. He loves you. He's well pleased with you. Let's stand as we close here this morning. God, thank you. Thank you, God, for just the reminder on this Father's Day of how you see us. And so today, we have a glimpse into how you saw your son, Jesus Christ. And God, it helps us understand the way you see us. And so, Lord, I pray that as we sing that song, maybe today and maybe in the days and years ahead, God, it may help us to adjust our view of our Father. Our Father. God, may it help our thinking. God, that we have a good, good Father who is perfect in all of his ways. God, thank you for being that kind of God in our lives. And so, Lord, help us to let go of the things in our life that we need to. God, help us, Lord, to forgive. Lord, when we've felt that we couldn't do it, give us the strength. And Lord, may we step out of that center and let you in that place, realizing that it's your vantage point, that it's your timing, that we're that arrow in your bow. And though it may feel difficult, though we may be feeling stretched at times, God, you know what you're doing, and you know where you're best aiming us. And so we trust you. God, thank you for being a good, good father to us on this Father's Day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful day. Dads, don't forget your gift out there. And I just want to ask all of you to save your visiting for outside if you could. We need to wipe the sanctuary for our next service. So uh, God bless you. Take care. Happy Father.